Praise his name, he lifted me. We're going to go on to the next one here, 304. I want to worship the Lord with all my heart. Give him my all and not just a part. opening hymn that I want to try and bring to you this morning. It's a hymn that spoke to me as a lad growing up in this church. And every line of this hymn asks a question. And as we sing it this morning, I want you to ask, see if you can answer each line. Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? And then where he's going to come.
just want to thank you for that good singing, and again, just uh, welcome to Bambridge Baptist Church this morning. We just want to welcome to our pul 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 pulpit uh, Andrew uh, Daly with us uh, today. It's good to have him. He'll be here both this morning and this evening uh, to minister the Word of God to us. So let's uh, uh, open up our time in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful uh, that today we can come, and we can come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can come in no other name. Lord, we can't come in our own strength. We can't come in our own merit. Uh, and Lord, we're not right. But yet, Lord, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ has made us right. And uh, Lord, the question was asked in that last hymn, are you right with God? And uh, so, Lord, this is a, a very soul-searching question. Uh, for all of us to undertake. And Lord, we need to have that right relationship with you first. And then, Lord, we need to look at our own lives uh, and repent of any sin and, uh, and unrighteousness that is in our, in our lives. But we thank you, Lord, for that verse of Scripture that says if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that we can fully trust in your character, fully trust in your integrity. Uh, Lord, we thank you, Father, for the fruit of the Spirit uh, that is indeed displayed by yourself. Lord, you are a loving God. You are a God of, of joy. You are a God of, of peace. You are a God of patience. Lord, you're, you're gentle and good and faithful uh, in every way. And we thank you, Lord, that you are self-controlled. And Lord, we pray that uh, these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, as the Bible says, uh, to have these things, Lord, we pray that they would be seen uh, in all of our lives. Lord, we do confess that we need you uh, these days. Lord, we live in a world that is uh, diametrically opposed to Christ and his people. And uh, so, Lord, we are, we are tempted on many, many fronts to do that which is wrong and to be mediocre in, in our living. But Lord, we just pray that you would give us strength and help uh, to live uh, uh, above the standards of the world and live according to the standards uh, of God. Father, we do want to just uh, lift up uh, uh, Eddie and Tanya Horner today, uh, to you today, Lord, in the passing of Eddie's mother uh, on Friday evening. And Father, we do just uh, ask uh, and give you thanks, Lord, that, uh, that Eddie's mom was saved. And we thank you, Lord, just in the way that you took her, Lord, was in a, in a peaceful and good way. And we thank you for that. And uh, Father, but we do pray for uh, Eddie uh, and his uh, wider family circle, Father, that you would be to them uh, what they need in these days. And uh, Father, we want to lift up uh, others who are uh, uh, sick uh, and um, having hospital appointments and treatment and, and such. Uh, and we do think especially of, of Clive these days, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just pray you would be to him again, uh, Lord, what he would need uh, in these difficult hours. Father, we do uh, uh, just think about uh, the pastor and his wife, and we thank you, Lord, for this uh, time of refreshment that they've been able to have these last couple of weeks, and uh, Lord, we pray that you would be pleased to bring them back to us uh, safely in the next day or two, uh, and Lord, that they would know the refreshment of God uh, upon them. And uh, Father, we do just uh, commend uh, the uh, ministry of your word uh, today, uh, Lord, not only in this place, uh, but also, Lord, in, uh, in and around our province, uh, down the, the south of Ireland and across the water and all over the world, Lord, where the, the word of God is being faithfully proclaimed. We pray, Lord, that there would be a great ingathering of, uh, of souls that will be rescued uh, from the, the very uh, grasps of sin and death. Uh, and, Father, we pray, Lord, for your people that might be uh, just a bit backslidden or a bit sort of uh, uh, dull in their walk. I pray, Lord, that you might, uh, by your spirit, just exercise in their lives and uh, give them an excitement in their soul and a restoration in their soul, a fire in their soul uh, to walk with God uh, in these days. So, uh, Father, you know all about the, the world in which we, we live and, Lord, the difficulties that are there and men and women that are getting together to try to sort things out and to have summits and elections and all these things. Lord, we thank you that none of these things has escaped your attention. 
And uh, Lord, you are in the midst of all those things and working in the background. And so, Father, we would just ask that there would be peace, especially that would come to lands that are, that are torn by, by war and strife uh, and inconsistency. But we know, Lord, that really the only solution to these things is if they bow the knee uh, unto Jesus. So, uh, so, Lord, we just lift up Andrew today to you. We give you thanks for him. Uh, thank you for past ministry that he has had in this place. And, Lord, we just pray that he would know uh, uh, the very upholding measure of God in his life this morning. And, uh, Father, we pray that uh, even as he opens up the scriptures, that there might be other things that you would highlight to him and uh, help him to uh, see these things, reveal things uh, to him, and, Lord, uh, and reveal things to us that we would need to know uh, about the character of God and about ourselves. So we uh, give you thanks, Lord, just for our time uh, together today, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Great, I'll just have uh, Mark uh, come up and give the necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see the house of the Lord so well filled in this lovely Lord's Day morning. Can I give you all a warm welcome to our Breaking of Bread service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those visiting with us and those who will be tuning in live on Facebook. May we know the blessing of the Lord as we fellowship in his presence this morning. Special welcome to our speaker, Andrew Daly. It's lovely to have you here. Uh, and may you know the blessing of the Lord and the help of the Lord as you share God's word to us today. After the ministry of God's word, we meet around the Lord's table to remember our Lord Jesus Christ as he has commanded us to do. If you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord, we invite you to remain as we break bread together. Alicia Baxter will be sharing the children's talk very shortly. Tim and Caroline Carson are on children's church. And Julie Bird, Aaron and Sarah Bowman are on crest duty. Then this evening, 5.45, a prayer meeting preceding the evening service at 6.30 p.m., our speaker this evening will be Andrew Daly again, and our singers this evening will be the Brook Quartet. Just the announcements for the incoming week on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study, uh, all being well with Pastor Taylor. And then on Friday, the Bible study with our elder Woody Price at 12.15 p.m. Next Lord's Day, the 23rd, church services running at the usual times of 11.30 and 6.30 p.m. And Pastor Taylor, God willing, will be speaking at both services next Lord's Day. Children's Talk will be Beverly, Children's Church will be Ali and Lindsay Farrell, and Children's Crash will be Jennifer Russell, Jill Guinness, and Diane Maidley. Just a few other announcements, you please take note. The Holiday Bible Club are having a planning meeting on Tuesday the 18th of June at 7.15pm in the Church Hall. If you would love to be part of this year's Holiday Bible Club, please plan to attend that meeting, and that is open to everyone. Message from Dave Selwood, just to thank you for all your prayers for Trina Teachit uh, football camp over these past two weeks. They had 186 children at the camps. That's amazing to be able to share the word of God with. So the follow-up work will take place over the next two months, and then the next Trina uh, Teachit camp will be on the Shankle, and that's starting on the 1st of July. So please remember uh, that before the Lord in prayer. Just to be card that's been sent into the Sunday school, dear Andrew, many thanks for a wonderful array of used stamps collected by the members and children of Bambridge Baptist Church. Please pass on our thanks to them. One stamp is equal to one Hebrew word, so that is a lot of words from one parcel. So if you have stamps and you don't know what to do with them, put them all into a bag. Make sure there's a good rim around the stamp and bring them into the church here and we will get them sent off uh, to to Pauline, uh, so she is very much appreciated for all that we do for her. As a church, we express our deepest sympathy to Eddie Horner and his family on the death of Eddie's mother on Friday. May Eddie and his family know God's presence and help, and may he strengthen and sustain them at this time. Please remember the family before the Lord in prayer, and to all the families who have lost loved ones over these past weeks, that round about them they may know at this difficult time the loving arms of Jesus. As our brother Woody prayed this morning, just a wee message from Ann Parks. He was praying for Clive. Clive is now home from hospital. Uh, he does have COVID, uh, so he's still struggling at this time. And Ann wants to thank everyone for their prayers and phone calls in the church. As a church, continue to pray for Clive and for all those who are fellowship 
who are not well at this time. Just has arrived in this morning, the Touch magazine for the Acre has now arrived. It's in the hall, and if you collect this, we book it and read through it every month. If you please lift yours on the way out this morning. That's all the announcements, and they're made subject in the will of the Lord. We're going to ask the list now if she'd come and bring the children's talk, and all the children, please make their way up to the front. Thank you. Okay, hopefully this is on. Yes, good stuff. You think after doing this so many times you'd know if the microphone's on or not. <laughs> so everybody come on up. Good stuff. Does the ones in the back row want to come up to the front row so you can see? Because I have some things to set my table. Or if, if you can see from there, that's okay. But there's plenty of room in the front for you. Right. You can get your Bibles out for me, and we're going to look for the book of Ephesians, which is in the Old Testament, because we're going to read a verse or two from there. All right, Daniel, are you coming up to the front? Or is he getting his Bible? He's getting his Bible. Good stuff. So if you look for Ephesians, it's near the back of the Bible, and we're going to go to the third chapter. And at the end of that chapter, we're going to find the verses... 18 and 20. So I'll give you a wee second. We're going we're gonna to come back to that verse in a wee minute. So this morning I want to think about pets. Who has a pet at home? Yes, a few people. Adults, who, who all has pets? Okay, a lot of people ha have pets, good stuff. So if you don't have a pet, you can just imagine that you have a pet. You, whatever pet you wish that you had, you can just imagine. So I couldn't bring my cats with me this morning, my real cats, but I brought this little cat um, that was a gift for me. So you can just imagine that he's real this morning. Um, at home, me and Sam have two cats. They're called Bonnie and Lilo, and we love them very much. They're long-haired, they're fluffy, and we adopted them a couple of years ago. Now, what kind of things do you need to take care of your pets? Anyone? Yeah. You gotta feed them, yeah. What else? Yeah. We play with them, yeah. That's a good one. So I actually have a couple of toys in here that we use to play with our cats. So this is a little mouse you can throw about. No, it's not a real one. Don't worry. It's just a wee pretend one. And I have this. Now this is Bonnie's favourite toy. And she's outside this morning, so she doesn't mind that I borrowed it. But if you just crinkle it a wee bit. She comes running. Wherever she is in the house, she'll come running and I'll throw it on the ground and then she chases after it. More like a dog than a cat. <laughs> anyway, what else do we do? How else do we take care of them? Does anyone know what this is? Yeah, you brush them. So because ours are long haired, we really need to take extra care of brushing them. So this is a special type of comb that you use to get out their undercoat, which is their, their fur. So. If you brush them, you might also have to do what else? What might you do after, or what would you do before brushing them? Yeah. Wash your hands. Yeah, we wash them sometimes. So sometimes they get very stinky. And we have little puppy and kitten shampoo that we've had to use. They don't like it at all, but sometimes it needs to be done. Um, and then what's another thing that you might not necessarily do with a cat, but you might do with a dog? Yeah. Yeah, you might pick up what they do outside, but what, what are you doing when they're outside? <laughs> might take them on a walk, yeah. Now you, you might think I'm crazy for this, but this is actually a cat harness. And um, you put the little cat's head through here like this. Now there is a purpose to why we had this. Um, whenever the kittens were very small, they weren't allowed outside until six months after we had got them. And being cautious cat parents, me and Sam were afraid to let them out on their own. So we bought them little cat harnesses. This is a bit big for this cat, but anyway. We bought them little cat harnesses and little leads so that we could give them supervised outside time. Now they just run around like hooligans, but we had these for them. So these are all different ways that you might take care of your pet. And Joshua mentioned one earlier, and that is food. They, they love this wet food. This is turkey flavor. But do you think they worry about the food? Do you think they worry about if they're going to get food or not? No, 
They don't worry. They might worry that you're a wee bit late feeding them, but they don't worry that they're going to get fed because they know that we take care of them. And why do we take care of our pets? Because we love them. We love them. We love our pets so much, and that's why we take good care of them. That's why we play with them, we brush them, we wash them, we take them out for walks, take care of their business and all that. We do that because we love them. And that's like God and how he loves us. We're thinking about Father's Day today, but I want to talk about our Father that we have in heaven. And in Matthew, it tells us that he takes care of even the birds. So in the same way that we love our wee animals, we love our wee pets. Even if you have a fish, you can still love your fish because you still have to feed your fish. God loves us even more than we can love our pets. And he tells us that in the Bible. So if you get your verses that we were looking for earlier, that was in Ephesians 3, um, verse 18 and 19 says, May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That is one of the many verses in the Bible that tells us how much God loves us, you know. And so, like our wee pets, they don't worry about if they're going to get fed or not. We don't have to worry either because God loves us so much. And that's why it's so important to read our Bible I was looking at my old Bible that I had as a child and it was really good because it had loads of verses at the front of it. If you were feeling scared or worried or anything, it would tell you what verses to go to. And God doesn't want us to worry either. So if you're thinking about how much you just love your wee pet, well, just know that God loves us even more than that. So we're going to sing a wee song together. We sang this last week. Uh, do you guys want to come on up? I'll pull this over here. We sang this last week as an opening chorus, and I just thought it was a lovely wee chorus. So we'll all stand after the introduction. me in your Bibles this morning to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And when you're finding the place, let me thank Woody for his kind words of welcome and your pastor's invitation to be with you today. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, the dilemma of despondency. The dilemma of despondency. And again, do remember the gospel service tonight. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of the great white throne judgment the sinner's day in God's court. And if you've got friends that are interested in prophetic things, or you can get an unsaved family member onto the sound of the gospel, well then do make that effort to join with us tonight. But this morning we're in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll commence reading please at verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. 
Then Jezebel sent a messenger on to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he arose, and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. The angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose, and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights, unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth, and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and a strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and, and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over, over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mulholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. And we'll end there at verse 18, and let's come before the Lord and ask for his help this morning. Our Father, we thank you again for the privilege of being able to publicly open the Word of God. We thank you that we have a copy of your divinely inspired and inerrant Word in our hands this morning. And Father, as we come around your Word, we long that God, through his Holy Spirit, would speak to us. And so we pray this morning, speak, Lord, in the stillness. While we wait on thee, hush our hearts to listen in expectancy. For we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. During the Great Depression of the last century, a certain man was sitting on his backyard porch one day, waiting for his social security check to be delivered. He went out into the post box to collect that check, and on his way back, he had this thought, is this all there is now to my life? Is this all that is going to be from this time on? just sitting waiting week by week for my social security check to come in. It was a discouraging thought. He became despondent, and that man thought he was going to do something about it. So he took out a little notebook, and he started to literally count his blessings. He named them one by one, and he was surprised by what the Lord had done. One of the things that the Lord had blessed him with was that he was the only one in the whole world to have his mother's famous recipe for fried chicken. And so he went down to the local restaurant and he asked them, could he start cooking their chicken? Very soon that was the most popular dish on the menu and he left that job and opened up his, his own restaurant. Very soon it started to snowball and he soon had a chain of restaurants and he worked in it until the day he died. That man was Colonel Saunders. 
the chain was KFC. Discouragement could have finished off Colonel Sanders, but in the dilemma of discouragement, he counted his blessings that God had given to him, and he opened one of the most successful businesses that came out of the Great Depression. I wonder, dear friend, this morning, can we not all testify to the fact that the dilemma of despondency comes and hits us at some point in our life? No matter what age we are, no matter our circumstances, no matter our social conditions, there's periods of despondency and discouragement that come into our lives. Perhaps that's where you are this morning. You've come from a difficult week. You're going through a very difficult period in your life, and it seems that there's no light at the end of the tunnel. This morning you've come in, you're discouraged, you're despondent, perhaps even depressed. Then we come and we are in good company for there's many people in the Word of God that were despondent and depressed. We find many people such as Jonah. I mean, Jonah was a mighty man of God who the Lord chose to bring a revival through in the land of Nineveh. Yet Jonah found himself in the period of despondency. He said, O Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. Think of Moses. He was God's chosen man to lead the children of Israel through the wilderness, yet he wanted to give up as well. He said, kill me, I pray thee, out of thy hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. Jonah, Moses, and now we come this morning to 1 Kings chapter 19, and we see Elijah, another man who suffered from this dilemma of despondency. James in his little epistle reminds us that Elijah is a man of like passion such as we are. In other words, he has the same nature as you and I. He has the same physical, emotional, spiritual weaknesses. And yet in the word of God, Elijah is a giant of the faith. See, Elijah had wrought one of the most amazing victories just a chapter back on the top of Mount Carmel. He was a great prophet of God. You remember that he was on the Mount of Transfiguration representing the prophets of the Old Testament. He was one of two people that were raptured into heaven without going through the article of death. Yet here's a man in 1 Kings chapter 19 that perhaps we can identify he's fearful. He's exhausted. He just wants to throw in the towel. He feels all alone. Here's a man who's so despondent that he says in verse 4, Lord, take away my life. He's got to the point in his life's experience when he just doesn't want to go on. He wants God to take him home. You see, Satan had used his masterful tactic on God's servant to feel as if there was no more use in him living, that his work was done on earth, that his circumstances were much too difficult, and that it would have been better if the Lord had just taken him home. I wonder if Satan whispering that to some beleaguered believer this morning. He's saying your time is through. There's no ministry left for you to do. Your best days are behind you. My dear friend this morning, thank God he's a liar. God can use you. God has a ministry for you. And Elijah was going to find that out soon enough. But think with me this morning about the timing of Elijah's despondency. See, in the previous chapter, there was an amazing work done for God that was wrought through Elijah. The scene is Mount Carmel. And there's Elijah standing at the top of the mountain. He's confronting 450 prophets of Baal. And the battle was really between Jehovah and the apostate parlous gods of Baal. The people had lowered their standards. They were engaging in ecumenical worship. And Elijah called on the Lord to rain down fire from heaven. And that day there was revival on Mount Carmel. The Lord sent the fire. The Lord sent the rain. And the people cried out that day, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Revival had broken out. The prophets of Baal had been slain. And up in verse 46 of chapter 18, you can see that the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. 
Here's a man that God is really using. He had seen how the Lord had demonstrated his mighty works in a mighty way. And God had met Elijah's need throughout his life in, in miraculous ways. You remember how the Lord sent the ravens to feed him. He was put at the brook to nourish him. He had received answers to his prayers on Mount Carmel. The Lord had honored his servant and God was glorified through his servant. He'd seen thousands of people turn from their idols to worship the Lord. And what should have been the hour of victory, whenever the opportunity was unparalleled, whenever they'd seen an unmistakable work done for God, Elijah should have been on the mountain peak. Yet here he is this morning and he finds himself in the valley. Isn't it amazing that in such a short space of time, we can go from glory to gloom, from victory to defeat. And here's Elijah and he finds himself in that place of despondency. How often does Satan come and do that in our own personal lives? We can be on the mountain top one minute. We've won a spiritual victory, if you like. Some besetting sin has been conquered for a time. We've witnessed for Christ. We've maybe even led someone to the Lord. And it feels like we're on the crest of the wave. Then the accuser comes, fills our minds with doubts and fears. He tempts us and we give in. Perhaps he even brings up past sins and he brings discouragement into our lives. And so quickly we can find ourselves going from the mountaintop right into the valley in such a short space of time. See, whenever we find ourselves in the spiritual mountaintop, we need to take heed lest we fall. For that's whenever Satan circles our name on his agenda. He wants to bring us right down to the very pit. Elijah was under the juniper tree. He wanted the Lord to take away his life. The timing of the despondency. But notice in verse 1 and 2 this morning, the topic of the despondency. Verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. King Ahab was a very wicked man. He was one of the most wicked kings in, in, at that time. He had influenced the nation to come and worship the false god of Baal. And he was there on that mountain top. He had witnessed the great events on Mount Carmel. And now he's gone home and he's relaying to his wife all that Elijah had done. Now, Ahab was an evil man. His wife was even worse, Jezebel. She's one of the most wicked women in Scripture. And she had Ahab right where she wanted him, right under her thumb. And, Ahab, and Jezebel and Ahab were furious. And so Jezebel issues a death threat against God's man. The word in the street is, wanted Elijah dead or alive. She's threatened the life of God's servant. She'll have him killed within 24 hours. Threat has been made against Elijah's life. What a serious matter. But compare a threat by an evil, godless woman to what Elijah has previously witnessed in his life. And in comparison, it really seems like very little. He stood on the top of Mount Carmel. He's seen how God had provided against all the odds. He has depended on the reliability of God in the past and his promises in the past. And here's a man, and he's proved God time and time and time again. And whenever Elijah had all the resources to be faithful, his fear paralyzed him completely. My, how easy would it have been for the Lord to sustain the life of Elijah? After all, God had created Elijah. He had sustained him right up until this point. He had protected Elijah from those apostate prophets of Baal. How easy would it have been for God to protect his life against an evil and a deranged woman? My, if only he had remembered the cry of the psalmist David. You remember the psalmist David was afflicted in all, all sides. Yet he cried out, my times are in thy hands. I mean, isn't that a good reminder for us all this morning? That the divine protecting hand of God never leaves us even whenever we're at our lowest ebb. 
that nothing can harm us, nothing can defeat us, that he doesn't give us a way in which we can escape. You think of the amount of times that Saul had tried to kill David. You think that time whenever Absalom tried to stage a coup against his own father. You think of all the tribulations that David went through, yet his confidence was in the Lord. He said, my times are in thy hand. My Elijah needed to learn that lesson as Jezebel sent out that threat. For what could harm that man whenever the divine protecting hand of God was upon him? Yet down in verse 3 we see, that when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. You see what Elijah does? He takes off, he runs for his life, he goes a full day's journey out into the wilderness, far away enough for Jezebel's servants not to be able to get to him. He had even left his own servant behind. He had left behind all. And that despondent servant of God runs from his troubles right into the heart of the wilderness. See, right up until this point, Elijah waited upon the Lord for his every need. See, if we took a trace of Elijah's life this morning, we could see that his life was directed by the word of God. We could see that his life was directed by the will of God. And so often we read, and the word of the Lord came unto him. See, the Word of God was, was his primary source of direction. Now God's man is taking a knee-jerk reaction. He's fearful. And the Lord never told him to run out into the wilderness. Elijah did that all by himself, and now he's found himself in a place of despondency, a place where he never should have been at. In fact, you'll notice down in verse 9 that the Word of the Lord came on to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? In other words, what are you doing in this cave, Elijah? What are you doing out in this wilderness? Is this the place that I've told you to come, Elijah? Is this the place where you should be hiding for fear of a king and his wife that I have all power over? Yet how often you and I can do exactly the same thing. We can become despondent. We can become uh, discouraged over some corner that we have got ourselves into by ignoring the word of the Lord. I wonder this morning, is there some decision in your life that you've neglected to bring before the Lord, just like Elijah did? And this morning, you're in a real fix. Thank God there's mercy With the Lord, there's guidance, there's direction found in his word. And my dear friend this morning, never forget that God is over all circumstances. He can turn our night into day. He can change our gloom into glory if only we'll seek him. That's why it's so important that as Solomon reminds us that in all our ways we should acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. See, whenever we seek Him, whenever we trust Him alone, whenever He directs our path, we won't go wrong. For He works all things together for good to those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Elijah didn't wait upon the Lord. Instead, he ran out from this evil woman and he finds himself under a juniper tree in the midst of the wilderness. The timing of the despondency, the topic of the despondency, but notice again with me the toll of the despondency. See, despondency and depression, they just don't impact us mentally and that's it. It's not just confined to the mind. And if you know anybody with chronic depression, they'll tell you that it affects every aspect of their life. Often people, they can't eat, they can't function, they can't go outside, they're physically exhausted. Those are effects of despondency. We see this in the life of Elijah. For Elijah's in such a dark place that he feels that there's no point in going on. Look at verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. He requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. You see, the pressure of despondency had become so great on Elijah that it felt that it would have been better for him if he wasn't here. How does a man, a woman, or a young person get into such a state? 
There's reasons that you and I will never understand. But yet we see some symptoms of this in the life of Elijah. For after all, Elijah was physically wrecked. I mean, here's a man, and he has a body just like you and I. He's not immune from getting tired. He's not immune from physical pain. You think of what he's been through. He's witnessed three years of famine. He's slain 450 prophets of Baal. He's missed several meals. He's been in intense prayer. He's been up Mount Carmel twice. He's made a 20-mile round journey to Jezreel. He's went another 90 miles out into Beersheba and another day's journey into the wilderness. How tired he must have been. He needed rest. He was physically exhausted under the weight of the spiritual battle. The great preacher George Whitfield, who toured up and down the United Kingdom and America, he had a schedule that would have put modern preachers to shame. But someone came to Whitfield and asked him, do you ever get tired of the work? Whitfield replied and he said, I sometimes get tired on the way, but I never get tired of the way. You see, Elijah was weary in well-doing. He was physically wrecked. But not only was he physically wrecked, but he was emotionally strained. For after all, he was so fearful of wicked Ahab and, and Jezebel. And the fear of man had become a snare in the life of Elijah. And instead of that fearless prophet of God standing up and being counted, just like he did on Mount Carmel, here he is and he's crippled with fear. Worse than the weight of fear, he felt that he was all alone. You see that down in the end of verse 10 says, I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. See, Elijah thought that he was the only person that was engaged in the battle for God. He felt that it was him alone against the world, and if it weren't for him, there'd be nobody. My, you and I can sometimes get to that place, can't we? A place of, of loneliness. Perhaps that's where you find yourself this morning, and perhaps even in the work of God, you feel that if it weren't for you, the work of God would collapse as if it's, it's God's work that solely depends on us. And how foolish that sounds and how foolish that is, but humanly speaking, we can get to that point, can't we? We forget that it's, it's God's work. Elijah had forgotten that too, and he's emotionally strained. And Elijah really thought that. He thought he was somebody. And uh, now, whenever he's, he's under the juniper tree, he finds out that he's really a nobody that God was using, and that's a tremendous realization. Was not what Moses realized all those years previously. You remember for the first 40 years of Moses' life, he lived in the lap of luxury, thinking he was somebody in Pharaoh's palace. For the next 40 years, he spent in the backside of the desert, realizing that he was a nobody. And then for the final 40 years of his life, he was seeing what God could really do through a nobody. And Elijah was starting to realize that he was a nobody. For look at the end of verse 4, because he said, I am not better than my father. I mean, whenever Elijah must have looked back over the history of that nation, did he really think he was any better than Abraham or Isaac? Did he think he was better than Jacob or Moses? Did he think that he was better than David? You see, it seems like Elijah was getting an inflated ego. He believed himself to be better than he was. And when he was reminded that he wasn't all he thought he was cracked up to be, he couldn't cope with it. And he went to a pit of despair that he couldn't bear. I just wonder, did Elijah take him to that place to teach him a lesson about humility? Now what the Lord done with the Apostle Paul, you remember he had that thorn in the flesh. And he went before the Lord those three times to take it away. And the Lord said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. But then we find out the reason for the thorn. Paul said, unless I should be exalted above, above measure. He didn't want to be exalted above all measure. He, he saw these trials of life as a humbling experience. And this is what God, I think, was doing with Elijah here. Elijah was physically Wrecked. He was emotionally drained, but he was also mentally strained. I mean, who wouldn't be? 
There's a threat out against his life. He was the most wanted man alive. And on top of all that, the strain of spiritual service is demanding, not to mention that he was grappling with the false cults. Where does Satan attack us most? The mind. It's not why the Apostle Paul told us to put on the helmet of salvation to protect our mind, to protect our thoughts. Elijah was physically wrecked, he was emotionally strained, he was mentally drained, but notice also that he was spiritually pained. You see, the work of God takes energy. The work of God takes its strain, perhaps in a way that no other work can do. And how easy it can be for the servant of God to be spiritually pained. See, Elijah was ministering in public, but the public never seen the things that go on in the background. The people saw the results of the ministry, but it all took it out on, of the prophet of God. And here's Elijah, he's at his lowest point. He's in the wilderness, he's under the juniper tree, he's at the end of his teller, he's absolutely spent. See, whenever we get to that point in our life's experience, uh, mind you, that can happen to any of us. That's when Satan circles our name on his agenda because we're at our weakest. Our defenses are down and he comes along with his tool of discouragement. I wonder, dear friend, is that where you are right this moment? That work that you're involved in, you're ready to resign. That Sunday school class that you feel out of touch with, you don't want to go back in September and they're driving you to despair. That missionary organization that you're involved in and you just want to pack it all in and this morning you feel like Elijah. You're under the tree of despondency and you're crying out to the Lord. Well, the good news is this morning that there's not only the time of despondency, there's not only the topic of despondency and the toll of despondency, but when we have Christ in our life, we have Christ in every circumstance, and that means that there's tenderness in the despondency. See, the very character of God is tenderness. There was none so tender that ever walked the face of this earth than the, the lovely Lord Jesus. Do you remember how he dealt with those wayward disciples? Simon Peter, that man that had utterly forsaken the Lord, he tenderly followed him out to the shores of Galilee to restore that fallen disciple. What about Doubting Thomas? That man that said, I'll not believe unless I see the print of the nails in his hand and thrust my hand into his side. And what did the Lord Jesus do with him? Did he rebuke him? No. Did he throw him out of the disciples because he didn't have enough faith? No. The Lord came and he tenderly met Thomas at the very point of his need. And right in 1 Kings this morning, we see that the Lord ministered very tenderly unto his servant Elijah. You see, the Lord had already ministered unto Elijah, even if he didn't realize that. That juniper tree that he was sitting under was the Lord's juniper tree. He was being sheltered from that Middle Eastern burning sun. But notice this morning that God not only provided the tree, but he provided for Elijah physically in verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and let him down again. Here's a man, and he's stuck out in the middle of a wilderness. He's fled so quickly without making time for provision. He's exhausted with a lack of sleep. And what does the Lord provide him with, first of all? Food, drink, sleep. Not so practical. Yet the Lord provides us with that. And truly we can say this morning that we're blessed and great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. The Lord provided for him physically, but notice that the Lord also provided for him spiritually. Because you see that he got a word from the Lord in verses 12 and 13. And after the fire is still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now it was a word of rebuke, albeit a very gentle one. But if there was ever a man that needed a word from the Lord at a particular time, it was Elijah. 
And the Lord came and he ministered and he spoke to Elijah in a very personal way. He says, Elijah, what are you doing out here? You're not meant to be hiding away in this cave. I have work for you to do. And God was meeting Elijah's spiritual need by doing what? By calling him back to the task that he was first commissioned to and which was required of Elijah. See, he needed to realize that he still had a work. He still had a purpose for God and his plan. And not even a wicked king and his wife could thwart that purpose. Do you see the command of God in verse 15? The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way. The word of God came to Elijah to jolt him out of his despondency. And for Elijah, the word was that he was to get going again for God that his ministry wasn't over, that there was still work to be done. And Elijah had to anoint Nimshi to be king over Israel. He had to anoint his successor, Elisha, to be the prophet in his place. There was work still to do for, for God's servant. Yet what was the devil telling Elijah? Oh, your ministry's through. Your days of usefulness for God are done. But for Elijah, it was, never, it was never final because he had to go on his way. He had to go and return. There was work for him to do. God provided for Elijah physically. He provided for him spiritually. But notice as well that he provided for him emotionally. For at a time in Elijah's life, whenever he thought that he was all on his own, God says to Elijah down in verse 18, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You see, there was a faithful remnant in Israel, 7,000 of them that were standing behind God's prophet. He had company in the fight of the battle, and what was more, he had Almighty God on his side, irrespective of the power of the people irrespective of the number of people against him. You see, in the school of divine mathematics, God plus one always equals a majority, irrespective of the amount on the opposing side. Elijah suffered the dilemma of despondency. But the God of all comfort came and he ministered to Elijah in his very hour of need. Tell me this morning, dear friend, what's your need? Are you despondent? Are you downhearted this morning, perhaps even depressed, and it feels this morning that there's no way out? Then lift your eyes heavenward this morning. Take comfort in the words of the one that said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, no matter where you find yourself in. And this morning, whatever you're going through, we have a Savior that is touched by the very feeling of our infirmities. And somewhere standing in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the friend that cares and truly understands. Somewhere standing in the shadows, you'll find him and you'll know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your word not only paints your servants in all of their good lights, but it points to them whenever they're at their very darkest moments. And we thank you, Lord, for God's prophet Elijah and how we can sympathize with him for so often we can come across this dilemma of despondency. And Father, there's maybe even some in our meeting this morning who are going through that valley experience of despondency and perhaps even depression. Lord, minister to them through thy word and by thy spirit. Bring that comfort that only the Lord can provide. And may each one of us cast all our care upon him, for he careth for us. Father, we thank you that you've met our, met our greatest need, the need of salvation. And we thank you that we can say with the Apostle Paul this morning that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And Father, if there's any this morning that are in the meeting that still haven't realized that, may this be the morning whenever they realize that there's a God that loves them, a Savior who died for them, and Lord, that they come and they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those of us that love you, we ask, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts this morning. And Lord, that we would stand on your every promise. For we ask it in the Savior's name. Amen.
going to stand in closing this morning and sing, standing on the promises of Christ our King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, please, after we get the introduction. Thank you for your presence with us this morning. Be with those that must leave us now, but give us an exercise, we pray, to stay and remember the Lord in his own appointed way. And may we cast our eyes to Calvary. And may our thoughts always be on him and in his finished work. And we pray, Father, that our time of remembrance would be sweet. We ask it all in the Savior's name. Amen. <laughs>